How can Christians make a political impact? That's what I want to think about in this first session. How can Christians make a political impact? And then in the second section, session, we're going to think about how can I love church members with whom I disagree politically? How can I love church members with whom I disagree politically? And look, if you only have time for one of these two talks this afternoon, you're like, oh, I'm really dying to get outside. It's so nice out. But I can listen to one talk. Turn the thing off now and listen to the next one. I like this talk too. This talk's actually more foundational. Nonetheless, I think that second talk might be a little bit more where a lot of Christians are at, or at least things are a burden of my heart. Okay, but this first one is, as I said, as to how to make a political impact. I'm giving it a practical how-to framework, but let me tell you what I'm really doing here. I'm trying to help us rethink faith and politics from the Bible, okay, both in this talk and in the next. My concern is that as Christians in America, very often we let our Americanism determine how we read the Bible instead of letting the Bible determine what it means to be a citizen of this nation, what it means to be Americans. Let me give you an example. What would you say is one of American Christians' favorite verses? I think of a few political verses, political verses. I think of a few political verses in your head for a moment. I think one of the most favorite Christians in America, quick to throw it out, out is, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and what is God is God's. And we, we think about that verse kind of like, just pretend I have, I have a whiteboard here, and I, I draw one circle, and I got Caesar's things, and then I draw another circle, and God's things, and in the, in the Caesar's things circle, what do I got? I got politics, I got culture, government, all of those things. And over here in the circle called God's things, worship, evangelism, salvation, church. And when we let our Americanism affect or determine how we read the Bible, I think that's how we read a verse like that with these two separate, maybe, maybe they overlap a little bit, these two circles, but they're, they're kind of separate circles. In other words, you, you want to keep your politics and your religion separate, right? Keep your politics and your religion separate. But is that what Jesus is really saying in that verse? Well, let's think about the context. Jesus says, somebody give me a coin. He holds up the coin and he says, Who, whose image is on this? Whose inscription? And they say, Caesar's. And he says, well, to render to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God's. But stop and think about that for a second. He's speaking to a bunch of Jews. What would every single Jewish person there listening know when he said, whose image is on it? And they said, Caesar's. What do they all know? Caesar's and whose image? God's. In other words, you, you don't have two circles, Caesar's things, God's things. You really have, Jesus would say, one big circle, God's things. And inside of that, a smaller circle, Caesar's things. And that's why Jesus would later say to Pilate, you would have no authority if I, it hadn't been given to you from above. Or as he himself says a few chapters later in, in Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Even Caesar's authority. But again, when we let our, 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 what it means to be an American uh, determine how we read the Bible, we, we miss that. And that's, that's why I think in many cases we need to rethink faith and politics. Okay, so that's, that's my sneaky behind-the-curtain goal to help us rethink faith and politics. But out here on the stage, I'm just giving you a six-part practical how-to talk, how to make a political impact, all right? You ready? Typically, people think about making a political impact by bringing a bigger gun right? Isn't that how we do it? So you can out shoot, outflank the enemy. You have two sides, both trying to, you know, win against the other. So you have the Americans or the colonialists and the British, and you have the, the, the North and the South, and you have the, the cowboys and the Indians, and you have, 
the Republicans and the Democrats, and blue and red, and, and, and both sides want to bring a bigger gun to the fight to outflank. That's how you make a political impact. And the, cover, the cover of my, my book here, I don't know if you can see it, but you got two boxing gloves with the donkey and the, the elephant, and, the, and these, these two gloves are in a fight, and they're, they're coming after one another. Now, so what happens when you become a Christian is, and you move to Washington, D.C., you, you figure out, okay, well, which, which side am I on? Got to pick a side. I'm on this side or I'm on that side. And then along the way, we, we start saying things like, well, this is the Christian cause. This is clearly the Christ way. This is what Christ would do. But now you got Christians on both sides. Christians on this side saying this is the Christian way. Christians on that say, side saying that is the Christian way. And so you got Christ against Christ. And so what do you have? You have a, the church in the middle and the gloves are crunching it, getting smashed. And we give talks to Christians in politics and say, hey, look, we, we got to be Christians as we go about this. Um, you know, we got to make sure we're going to be honest. We got to be salt and light. We got to maintain a good witness, be nice. But basically, we're just joining into the battle between one side and the other. The church gets smashed. Christ is against Christ. And in the process, our witness is smashed. Our integrity is smashed. Our salt doesn't stay very salty and our light isn't very light. And we look just like the world. Okay, so how do we make a political impact? Six steps. Six steps. Number one. Repent of your sin and put your trust in Jesus. I didn't expect that, did you? But there it is. Number one, repent of your sin and put your trust in Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's a king. He possesses, as I said, all authority in heaven and on earth. Now just think of what this king said when he first showed up in his ministry. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, what is the gospel he's proclaiming? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This, friends, is what it means to be a Christian. You repent. Or this is how you become a Christian. You repent and you believe in the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is the good news that though God created us good, we have tried to be our own kings and we've rejected him as king and we've earned the just penalty, sin and of our sin, death, for our self-enthronement, for our kingship as we've gone to war like Cain and Abel against one another because we wanted to be king and we didn't want him to be king. But then the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, came. He lived the life that we should have lived in perfect obedience to the Father, died the death that we should die on the cross, paying the penalty for our sin, so that everybody who repents and believes and follows after this King and names Jesus as King and Lord is united together as a new people, a new citizenry under this good and great and mighty King. That's the good news of Christianity. And when you accept that good news of Christianity, your politics will change dramatically. When I became a Christian in my early to mid-20s, my politics changed dramatically. Why? Does that mean, oh, I'm a, I'm a white evangelical? That means I'm a Republican now? Is that, is that what I mean? Well, no, that's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when you say Jesus is Savior and Lord, you are saying He's King over all of your life. And you join a church. This, this new society, this, this new kingdom, these, these, or this outpost of this kingdom. And you're saying, I'm following after him. That, that is my new politics that determines the rest of my life. So friend, if you understand yourself to be a Christian, you understand that when you, when you were buried with him in baptism and raised again from the symbolic grave of baptism, your identity changes. You were, you were born again. And, and that means... Suddenly, the most important thing about you is not your gender. It's not your national citizenship. It's not who your parents are. It's not how much money you have. It's not who, what your skin color is or your nationality, your intelligence or beauty or whether you're married or single or anything else that the U.S. Department of Census 
would, would, would say and use to categorize you or the college applications, what they say are the most interesting, important things about you. You know that those are no longer the most important things about you. What are the most important things? Who are you? You are a son or daughter of the divine king. You are an heir of God. You are a born again, new creation. You are brothers and sisters with all the fellow citizens of God's kingdom. That is who you are. So when you become a Christian, you suddenly find yourself having to negotiate, renegotiate how you interact with all of those old categories. Okay, well, how do I relate to my parents now that I'm a follower of Jesus? Now, if you have a Christian parents, you probably haven't thought about that too much. But if you're living in a Muslim country, you think about that a lot. That's a big change. How, how do I relate to my colleagues? How do I relate to my friends? How do I relate to my ethnic group? How do I relate to my government? How do I relate to the government at large? How do, how do I relate to with what society says it means to be a man or society says it means to be a woman? Now, I'm not saying all of these categories are no longer relevant. They're still very relevant. But now it's King Jesus who gets to define who we are in all of these different categories. And that's why the Bible calls us aliens and strangers and sojourners and exiles. This world is not finally our home. We know that and we await another city whose architect and builder is God. And what this means, friends, is you need to let go of your family identity, your national identity, your party identity, your ethnic identity long enough to hand it to King Jesus and say, okay, King Jesus, tell me what I do with that. I'm not going to hold on to it and let the world tell me what I am. I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to let you define it for me. Tell, tell me how to use this. Now, some of this stuff, some of these aspects of my identity, I need to throw away. Other aspects of my identity, I'm going to refashion according to your will in my life. But the point is, King Jesus, you are now calling the shots. I think we become better friends to America. We become better friends to our party. We become better friends to our ethnicity. We become better friends to our gender when we love Christ first. Because then we can be honest with those different groups that we occupy. And we can point out what's truly good in those different groups and what's not so good in those different groups. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy, says Proverbs. And when the are people whose politics begin with the phrase, Jesus is king, and let me be clear, our politics begins with that phrase, Jesus is king, our political posture then is not to withdraw, disengage. Our political posture is not to lean in and dominate and crush. Our political posture, sons of the divine, daughters of the divine king, is always to represent. I'm here on behalf of King Jesus. I'm representing him. Representing him at home, representing him in the public square, everywhere I go. So how do we make a political impact? Number one, repent of your sins and put your trust in Jesus. Number two, put your primary political hopes and invest politically first in the church. Put your primary political hopes and invest politically first in the church. Might sound like a weird thing to say. What am I talking about? Well, many Christians in America continue to put their greatest political hopes in the nation. Since colonial times, we have called the nation a uh, city on the hill. Since Abraham Lincoln's day, we have asked our leaders to provide and think of Lincoln's second inaugural address. If you come to my city, D.C., and you walk up the steps of the Lincoln Monument and you look to the right and you see inscribed in marble those beautiful words of the, uh, the second inaugural address where he talks about uh, achieving and cherishing a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Achieving and cherishing a just and lasting peace with ourselves and with all nations. Well, stop and think with me for a second. 
Where should we first and foremost achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace with ourselves and with all nations? Who is the city on the hill? The nation? Well, Jesus is talking about the church. The church is where we will achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. We are the people called to go to all nations, making disciples, baptizing, teaching everything that Jesus command. Conversion makes us citizens of Christ's kingdoms and places us inside of embassies of that kingdom and puts us to work as ambassadors for heaven's righteousness and heaven's justice. The local church, in other words, should be a model political community for the world. It's where we first love, learn to love our enemies and first learn to beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. It's the most political of assemblies since it represents the one with final judgment over presidents and prime ministers. And together in our assemblies, we confront and call the nations with the light of our king's words and the saltiness of our lives. I love Michael Horton's reflections on the political nature of our message and our work. Michael Horton says this, As a minister, I am called regularly by God to make a political speech, a deeply partisan political speech. However, it is not to rally the troops in defense of Christendom against the infidels of various sorts. It divides not between Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, but between Christ and Antichrist. Preaching, it would seem, in this broader definition of how I'm using the word, is political. So is evangelism. Both kinds of speech call people to bow before a king whose claims are higher than every other king's. So friends, make no mistake, the political leaders and parties, the movements and the principalities of this world are messianic. They want your worship. That's the lesson of the Tower of Babel and the people in Egypt under Pharaoh, of Nebuchadnezzar and the fiery furnace and Pilate and the Roman Empire. It's the lesson of the beast in Revelation, which I understand to be not just a future figure, but the ongoing patterns of governments of this world who demand our worship and would crush all those who oppose them, especially Jesus' people. Just ask our Christian friends in China or Iran or parts of Nigeria. They know all too well the beastly nature of the governments of this world. Uh, think of Jonah's sermon in Nineveh. Here's his sermon. Judgment's coming. Here he is speaking to Nineveh, filled with all these false gods, and he says, judgment is coming. And, and then the text reads, immediately the city believed God and repented. Think with me for a moment. Was Jonah's speech political or evangelistic? Yes. They believed God. They repented of their false gods. And the city was changed. Their lives were changed. In other words, friends, what I'm saying in this second point, put your hope firstly, political hopes firstly in the church. I'm saying we need to shift our focus first from redeeming the nation to living as a redeemed nation. Uh, shift our focus from transforming the culture out there to living as a transformed culture here in each of our congregations. And then it's the lessons that we learn in here, inside the church, which should inform our public engagement outside of it. Now, church and state are distinct and God-given institutions, and they must remain separate. I'll get to that momentarily. But please understand that every church is political all the way down and all the way through. As I said earlier, every government is a battleground of God's. No one separates their, poli their politics and their religion. Not the Christian, not the agnostic, not the secular progressivist. We cannot separate 
our politics, politics and religion. We're all serving our gods in the public square. And in the church, likewise, we are living in a political, because Jesus is king over everything, framework. Let, let me give you a taste of what I mean about the political nature of the church with a story about one of my, a true story about one of my fellow church members, Charles. Made up a name for him. Charles is a Washington, D.C. speechwriter. He's written speeches for cabinet members and party chairmen and other D.C. insiders whose names you would know and recognize. And Charles' work, to be sure, places him at the very center of American politics. Charles also spends time with Freddie. And Freddie, who was homeless, heard the gospel, repented and believed, and became a member of our church. And for a while, he was a good member of the church, but over time, the elders discovered that Freddie was stealing from members of the church and lying to them in order to steal, in order to support his drug addiction. And we challenged Freddie and we pursued Freddie, but he refused to give up his lying and his stealing. He refused to repent of it. And so finally, on one sad day, the church removed Freddie from membership in the church as an act of discipline. And that's when Charles, the speechwriter and member of the church, became involved. And he started spending time with Freddie, who had was now removed from the church, reading the Bible with Freddie, calling Freddie to repentance. And little by little, Freddie began to repent. And little by little, Freddie started to come back. And then I remember one glorious Sunday evening in our church in a members meeting where Freddie stood up behind the pulpit and he read out, rather he, he preached his words of apology and forgiveness. Church, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God by, by stealing and lying from you in order to, to support this idol of mine. Will you please forgive me? And the church voted. And we brought him back in and we, we embraced him. The prodigal son had come home. Um, home. It, was a, it was a wonderful time. I'd love to keep talking about that. That's a different story. Let me get back to Charles. Here is the GDP-sized question about Charles. Which Charles is the political Charles, the speech writer or the disciple maker? Well, both. In fact, the disciple maker, Charles, would tell you that it's the disciple maker that gives integrity and meaningfulness to his work as a speech writer. After all, which which Charles, the disciple maker or the speech writer, concerns himself with things like education, welfare policy, uh, drug addiction? Well, both, right? So in both cases, Charles the disciple maker and Charles the speech writer, it's the same man living under the same king ruling, seeking to bring the same principles of justice and righteousness to play in his life, in his work, in his disciple-making, and in his speech writing. Let's place our political hopes, firstly, in our lives together as congregations to live out the justice and righteousness that God calls us to in Scripture. That's lesson two. That brings us to lesson number three about how to make a political impact. We must learn to be before we do. We must learn to be before we do. If our political hopes rest first in our churches, we must learn to be before we do. So my church is in the Washington, D.C. area. It's filled with young people like Charles who moved to D.C. wanting to make a difference by working in the various spheres of government. And their work matters. Their work is important. But as one of the elders of, uh, of the church, I often have to say to them, don't tell me you're interested in politics if you're not pursuing a just and righteous politics among other members of your church, old and young, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. So Paul in Romans 2 asked the Jews of his day, he says, you who preach against stealing, do you steal? Well, I got a few questions of my own. You who call for immigration reform. Do you practice hospitality with visitors to your church who are ethnically and nationally different than you? You who speak against abortion, do you embrace the single mothers in your congregation? Do you encourage adoption? You who talk about welfare reform, 
Do you give to the needy in your own church? Are you generous? You who proclaim that all lives matter, do your friends all look just like you? Uh, You who are concerned about the economy and the job market, do you obey your boss with a sincere heart, not as a people pleaser, but as you would obey Christ? You who share your political opinions on social media, do you gladly share the Lord's Supper with brothers and sisters in Christ who disagree with some of your opinions? Do you pray for their spiritual good? When I say we must be before we do, I mean the local church should strive to live out the justice and righteousness and love in its life together. Then it can commend such justice and righteousness to the nations. Don't tell me you want to lead a little lecture on how to be a good parent if you're not loving your children at home, if your children are abandoned or abused. We've got to start by being before we do. I like how Mark Dever put it. Before and after America, there was and will be the church. The nation is a certainty. I'm sorry, sorry, the nation is an experiment. The church is a certainty. It's number three. Number four, let the state do its job and let the church do its job. And those are separate jobs. I'm going to do this one very briefly for time's sake, but there's two things basically I want to say here. First thing to say, we have to be able to say at the same time two different things. We have to say, okay, the Bible teaches the separation of church and state, and I I believe it does. I'm not going to take the time right now to make that case, but I think the New Testament clearly teaches that, including passages like render to Caesar, what is Caesar and what God is God. But at the same time, We have to say uh, Christians' politics begins with this phrase, Jesus is king. It's really easy for us to let go of one of those two phrases. And Christians throughout history have let go of one of those two phrases. Some have said Jesus is king and therefore they've kind of combined church and state in ways I don't think the Bible calls us to. And other Christians have said, well, we got to keep the separation of church and state. And so they've They've not called Jesus kingship in different areas of the state. And so somehow, I think the Bible calls us to hold on to both of those truths at once. That's tough to do, but I think that's what the biblical testimony calls us to do. Okay, that's the first thing I want to say about the separation of church and state. Here's the second thing. Americans generally, and Christians specifically, misunderstand what the separation of church and state are. We think of it as being about the separation of Christian morals from the state. So I was teaching a group of college interns who had come, you know, they're college students out in different parts of the country and they come to D.C. for internships with a congressman or a lobbyist or something like that. And I was, I was teaching a class of them and we were talking about these kinds of things. And at one point, one of the students raised his hand. He said, well, hold, hold, hold on, Jonathan. Are you saying that we really should impose our morality on people through law? And I said, well, name one law for me that doesn't impose somebody's morality. Just one. And the class was quiet. They kind of thought, scratched their heads, and there was a chuckle. And that's right. There's no such thing. That's what law does. It makes moral judgments, right, wrong, better, worse, this way, not that way. Even a law that says Americans, unlike those nutty British, are going to drive on the right side of the road, depends upon certain assumptions about the value of human being and human life and the good of orderliness. Law, the job of law, is to impose moral judgment. That's what law does. The separation of church and state is not about the separation of moral principles from the law. And saying it is works great for the non-Christian. When the non-Christian affirms his belief in the separation of church and state, what he means or she means is the separation of my church from the state my organized religion from the state, not his own. He doesn't think he has a church. He's happy to impose all of his idolatrous morality on me 
Nothing holds him back. There's, you've never heard of the separation of idolatry and state. Lucky for him, too bad for me. The separation of church and state is not about the source of our morality as if, okay, well, you're getting those moral principles from this place where you go on Sundays and the guy opens the book and he preaches out of it and you get your ideas about you shall not murder from there and uh, no, separation of church and state. No, 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 we're, we're all coming with certain God or small g God directed moral principles. That's not what the separation of church and state about. Rather, biblically understood, the separation of church and state is that God has given one job to the state, the power of the sword, and another job to the church, the power of the keys. Different authorities, different jurisdictions. We can unpack that if you want during question and answer time. I'm not going to go any further down that line. Let me just say this. Insofar as non-Christians do not understand, never given thought to, oh, what's the authority of a church? We can't expect them to be sympathetic to our views. But Christian, I would say to you, do you understand what the authority of a church is? Because if you don't understand what the authority of the church is, you're going to have a hard time understanding biblically what the separation is between church and state. You're going to default to the non-Christian's approach to that, which makes it about morality, which screens you out. In the Bible, the separation of church and state is about the two different authorities God has given to each, which is going to obviously have an impact on the kinds of laws we might be willing to pass. We're talking about pornography or you know, law, state lotteries or, or, or in marriage and the nature of no-fault divorce or same-sex marriage. We're going to come with different moral positions. And you can't just quickly throw out the bumper sticker separation of church and state and disqualify uh, somebody's perspective because they're getting it from their religion. That's not what the separation of church and state in the Bible is about. That's number four. God has given a job to each. Number five. When you enter the public square, vote for justice as defined by the Noahic Covenant. When you enter the public square, vote for justice as defined by the Noahic Covenant. We, we could expand this point to everything you do in the public square. You know, lobbying, protests, lawsuits. I'm just going to isolate it on that question of voting because I think probably the most common question Christians ask on the topic of politics is, well, which candidate should we vote for? Which ballot measures should we support? And what I'm saying is vote for justice as defined by the Noahic Covenant. Can understand that, and we need to do a little biblical thinking here what has God established governments to do in the Bible? What is their job? What is the power of the sword for? And when we think about that question, what's the job of government? Simply as Americans, before we go to Scripture, what we tend to default towards is certain American answers to those questions. We, we talk about three shared principles of the American experiment. We talk about rights, freedom, and equality. We say governments exist to, to provide for rights, freedom, and equality. And, and that's how we think about it. The, the, the trouble is, people mean very different things by those words, rights, freedom, and equality. How about the right to an abortion? How about the freedom to define one's own gender? How about marriage equality? Well, depending on your God or gods, you're going to say those are good or bad rights, views of rights, freedoms, and equality. In other words, there's something behind our views of rights, freedom, and equality, which then dictate whether or not we think those are acceptable. What's behind them? What's a view of justice? Everybody has a certain conception of justice, which animates which determines whether or not we think that's a just set of rights, a just equality, a just set of liberties. Justice always comes first. Think about it. You'll never take away justice in order to accomplish freedom. But you know, like the prisoners or certain curfew moments, you might take away some freedom for the purposes of justice. Justice is primary. Rights, freedom, and equality are not. We're to pursue a just liberty, a just right, a just equality. Right comes before rights. Pay attention to the S. Right comes before rights. 
Rights are not free floating after all. Something or someone has to make that, those rights right. And that's what government does. According to Paul in Romans 13, according to Peter in 1 Peter 2, reward the good, punish the bad. This is right, this is not right. That's a just set of rights. Those are not just rights. Governments exist within a limited jurisdiction to define what's right, what's just. I think we get this first and foremost in Genesis 9, 5, and 6. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, we get it in Romans 13, I said, and I think we, it's confirmed in many other biblical texts. Think of 2 Samuel 8, 15. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and righteousness to all his people. In 1 Kings 3, 28, Israel stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. Or as the queen of Sheba, foreign queen, says to Solomon, because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. 1 Kings 10. Or as Proverbs says in 29 verse 4, by justice a king builds up the land. How do we build up the land by, from a government's perspective, by doing justice? Okay, so, so how do we define justice? What exactly is justice? Well, in the Bible, I'm not going to take the time to unpack this, to do justice, to make righteous judgments. I've got a standard of righteousness. I'm called to make a judgment. And I'm going to apply that standard of righteousness to that justice judgment I am called to make. That is what justice is in the Bible. And I think we first see this in Genesis 9, 6, which says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for man was made in the image of God. When does God give coercive authority to governments on earth? What is the original moment of authorization? It's right there. So as to keep the Cains from killing the Abels, post-fall, post-flood, God says to Noah and all humanity after, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed for, what's the foundation, what's the ground for? Man was made in the image of God. In other words, what's the standard of justice for governments? The standard of justice is whatever protects and upholds human dignity as defined by the fact that we are all God's, God imagers. God intends all governments in all nations to establish this basic form of justice on their citizens. Whether or not they acknowledge God, that is their job and that is what they will be held accountable to do. It's the work of establishing and upholding justice and preserving the lives and the flourishing of God's imagers. Noahic justice is a preservative or protectionist justice. The dominion mandate to be fruitful and multiply, to be humanity going throughout the earth continues. But now God adds this and he restates it in the first verses of chapter nine, Genesis nine. But now, as I said, to keep the Cains from killing the Abels, to make sure this crime doesn't continue to saturate and slow things down, he, he provides this coercive mechanism, this justice mechanism. And he states it in, in conjunction with his own promise not to destroy the world again in the flood. So I'm, I'm going to provide a platform of redemption for humanity to continue and for people come to a saving knowledge of me. So I'm going to put my bow of war down. The rainbow symbolizes that. And so that I don't destroy the earth, at the same time, I'm going to give governments to preserve the peace and order and preserve lives. So everything a government does, every law it makes, every court ruling it declares, every executive agency code it enforces, it should do for the purposes of protecting and affirming its citizens as God imagers. Its work of establishing or upholding justice must always be measured by the, the standard, the rule of the imago dei, the image of God in all humanity, so that anything that harms or hurts or oppresses, or exploits, or hinders, or tramples upon, or degrades, or threaten human beings as God's imagers, arguably becomes the target of government opposition. And, by implication, anything that aids 
and abets and promotes or encourages a set of conditions that contributes to the ability of God imagers to live out their vocation, their job of being God imagers, should be considered a candidate for possible government encouragement. Punish the bad, reward the good, Paul says in Romans 13. And why does a government do all of these things? Well, first, to establish peace and order. Second, listen to this, second, so that people are free to worship God. Genesis 9 and the giving of coercive governmental authority comes before Genesis 12 and the call to Abraham and the beginning of the plan of redemption for a reason. I'm going to establish a platform in peace and order, says God, so that my plan of salvation can get underway. And this is what we see in other places of the Bible. Acts 17, 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Or Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that, why should we pray for our kings and those in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God. Okay, okay, why is it good that we live peaceful and quiet lives, dignified in every way? This is good and pleasing in the sight of God. Who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of him? Do you get, you get, you get, you get the, the chain of events there, the chain of logic there in our prayers? So we pray for kings so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives. Why is it good for us to have peaceful and quiet lives? Because God wants all people to come to a saving knowledge of him. And that's how it happens. Do you see? Christians should care and pray for good, just government because, Paul says, you want them to get saved. And that helps us answer to the question of who do we vote for? Who should we vote for? Well, we should vote for the candidate, the party, the legislation, the ballot measures with a limited but clear view of what government has been authorized by God to do, to exercise judgment and establish justice, to build platforms of peace, flourishing, and order, to make sure people are free and not hindered from knowing God and being redeemed. We do not want a government that thinks it can offer redemption, but a government who views its work as a prerequisite for redemption of all of its citizens. It's like I want to teach my children to read common grace so that they can read the Bible, special grace. Likewise, I want a government that's going to build streets common grace, so that people can drive to church, special grace. A a government that protects the womb so that people can live and hear the gospel. A, A government that insists on fair lending and housing practices so that you can own a home and offer hospitality to non Christians. A government that works for education so again people can learn how to read their Bibles. That works to protect marriage and family so that husbands and wives can model Christ's love for the church. That polices the street so that you are free to assemble as churches unmolested and to make an honest living so that you can give money to the work of God and the nations. Now, you might disagree with any of the examples that I just provided. That's fine. I'm not trying to nail down those examples per se. But that that is the grid I want you to adopt. Government renders justice to establish order and peace, a platform on which we live, so that churches might do what God calls them to do. Number five. Number six. Enter the public square 
as ambassadors and principled pragmatists. I'm running low on time. I'm just going to skip right over that point. If you want to read about that point, it's in chapter six or seven or something of this book. How, how do we engage the public square as, as principled pragmatists? Meaning, well, use whatever arguments at work that are principled arguments for principled ends. There's, there's different ways of engaging the public square. And we're to use wisdom to accomplish those things, but within a principled set of convictions. And I'll just leave that one at that. Let me conclude. How can Christians like you and me, friend, make a political impact? Well, we repent of our sins, we put our trust in Christ, and we join a church. Let me put it this way. If you care to claim about politics, but you're not a member of an active local church, I'm tempted to say you don't understand politics at all. There's almost a sense in which you're like somebody who loves, says he loves cars because he gets down on his knees and plays with little Tonka trucks and matchbox cars and going vroom, vroom, when there's this big truck or car sitting right next to you that you could get in and drive. And what is that car, that truck? It's, it's the life of the local church. And so that's why my church cares about welfare policy. When church member Jane found herself homeless, we tried to place her in safe housing. And due to various mental difficulties, she refused help and she chose to sleep in a park instead. So Luther, a member of their church, went down to the park and slept on the nearby bench because he was concerned about her welfare. We care about tax policy. So Carlos, who spends his working days explaining to U.S. Congress tax implications of new legislation, has spent many an evening helping a family in crisis with their taxes. He's worked with the family's creditors and collection agencies because of their uncontrolled debt. We care about tax policy. My church also believes it's important to address America's race problem, or at least our own race problem. So I remember one Sunday morning when it was announced that I would be giving a talk on race and racism that Sunday evening, Patty came up to me after church and she said, I'm so glad you're talking about this, Jonathan. Can I confess something to you? I really struggle with black people. I just have a hard time and I know it's wrong, but I'm not sure what to do with it. I'm really glad you're gonna be talking about that tonight. And I said, uh, thank you so much for telling me, Patty. Patty, do you know, do you know Joe and his wife? And, and, and Joe's an African-American. She said, yes. And I said, well... Joe's a really, really godly man. Why don't you call Joe, invite yourself over to dinner, and tell him what you just told me? And she said, she said are you serious? And I said, I'm not sure, <laughs> but I think so. I wouldn't do that with just anybody, but I, I knew Joe. I, I trusted Joe's ability and his wife's ability to handle that. And you know what? She did. And you know what else? It went exactly as I expected it. Joe and his wife loved her as she confessed her sin. And she repented a little bit that day of her racism. And she helped the church, and Joe and his wife helped the church model just a little bit more what the justice and righteousness of God looks like for anybody who happens to be watching. Got to be before we do, I said. Friends, real politics doesn't begin with our political opinions. It begins with our everyday decisions. It doesn't begin with pu public advocacy that's a part of it. It begins with our personal affections. Please don't mistake that. Politics begins not all by your lonesome sitting behind a computer on social media. It begins with the brothers and sisters in Christ in your church. Inside the local church is where our Christian politics become complicated, authentic, credible, real, sticky, Loving.
It's in those real life situations where we're first forced to think about what righteousness truly is and what justice truly requires, what obligations we actually possess before God and our fellow God imagers, and we discover what we ourselves are actually made of and how we need a Savior, both for our own souls, but also for our life together. How do you make a political impact? There's a lot more that could be said. I think we can start there. Let me pray. Father God, we confess that we are too quickly reliant on ourselves. We're too quickly reliant on the ways and the devices of this world. And we don't look to your word and what it means to say Jesus is king and to follow after you. Forgive us, Lord. We pray that you would help us to love our local churches and take the lessons we learn there as we move outward from them. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.